Hello and welcome to Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. Unleashed is produced by Umbrex, which connects you with the world's top independent management consultants. I'm Will Bachman, and I'm here today with Cyrus Masumi, who's the founder of ZocDoc and now runs Humbition, an investing fund, and has a whole range of things going on. Cyrus, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. So Cyrus, you were telling me that you have three main pillars right now, now that you've, you've left ZocDoc. Tell me, what are your three pillars? Sure. So I, uh, I started a, um, when we, when we were running, uh, ZocDoc, uh, I, I found that the people who were entrepreneurs were among the most helpful investors that we had because they'd been through it before. And I felt that New York needed to have more operators turn investors. So I created a venture capital fund with my friend and college classmate, Slava Rubin, who was the founder and CEO of Indiegogo. And we invest in seed and series A companies, primarily based in New York. Uh, we're sort of industry agnostic. We're just really focusing on, on great founders. And so I spend a lot of time just helping founders, whether they were investors or not, building their next wave of companies. And so I, I, I do that. Um, I have a new startup that has recently uh, come out of stealth called Shadow, where I'm the founder and CEO, where we are solving a problem, um, an ancient problem of humanity uh, relating to lost. Uh, and we started with lost bugs, uh, reuniting lost dogs with their families. And it's uh, it's been an interesting journey and, and it's sort of a beautiful uh, case study and, and, and really using technology to make us more human. And uh, so I, I, I spend uh, a lot of time on that. And, and uh, I've had the privilege of, of uh, one of the, the schools I went to was Columbia, and I have the privilege of serving on the public, uh, the, the board of the public health uh, school, the Mailman School of Public Health. And as one can imagine, this is 2020 has really been a, a, a pivotal year, a critical year for public health. And We've been involved in, in the pandemic response. I've, I've been chairing a committee um, to basically help uh, help one of our our, our, our uh, leading virologists scale up his efforts uh, for COVID testing, and that's been very rewarding. And so, between those three things and uh, learning how to become better roommates with my dog during this pandemic, I've been pretty uh, pretty busy. Well, let's dive into that third one first. So. Tell tell us about the kind of COVID testing work that you've been you've been supporting. Sure. So uh, we've heard obviously a lot about testing throughout these months, um, at home tests, very quick tests, um, uh, etc. Antibody tests, and one of the things I think that has not been um, widely understood is the sensitivity of the tests are very variable. You know, many of these tests did not need to go through the same level of FDA approvals as they normally would uh, in, in, in regular times. And so they've had emer almost emergency approvals as such. And so there's a lot of issues with the inaccuracy of, of the tests that are out there. Most of the tests that, that have been out there are, are qualitative in nature. So they tell you, uh, yes or no, you have it, and, and, and with uh, perhaps a 30% inaccuracy rate, which is quite high, uh, literally you could be flipping a coin and, and, and perhaps uh, coming out with, with a similar result and with odds like that. And so when, when the pandemic first started, Gary Miller, who's the vice dean of research at the Mailman School, uh, met with uh, uh, our board, and he talked about uh, some of the work that was being done. Dr. Ian Lipkin, who is a star vi virologist at Columbia, he was uh, literally uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the movie Contagion. He was the, the medical uh, uh, advisor on that. He has been helping China throughout its own, uh, the current uh, pandemic, but prior, the, the prior SARS pandemic, he was involved with that. Uh, he won one of the highest civilian awards uh, possible from the government of China in the work that he's done. So he is um, really uh, the Indiana Jones of virus hunting. And he has come out, uh, he had developed a test called the C3 test, which was a highly sensitive COVID-19 test that um, is quantitative. So it would actually tell you the exact viral loads. And it was 
uh, the most sensitive test that we were aware of uh, globally. And in order to run this test uh, in, in its initial form, uh, it required uh, uh, several pieces of very expensive equipment. And we, was, uh, we wanted to very quickly start scaling up uh, scaling up the, uh, the, uh, the efforts and the amount of testing that they were able to do. Um, the issue was our board uh, had been very generous and had just gone through um, raising money internally for us to make sure that all of our students were okay and they were going to get home safely and, and, and given that the school had shut down. And so we, we had to look externally for, um, for funding sources. Um, we set a target of, of raising a million dollars. Uh, we started uh, by doing a, uh, we decided to go about uh, doing a crowdfunding campaign, which we launched in Indiegogo for this test that was called the C3 test. Uh, and it was really amazing. And in a very short amount of time, uh, we not only surpassed our $1 million goal, but we ended up raising uh, $3.2 million in total. And it was a real lesson to, uh, in, in terms of how to really uh, organize and motivate people around a very specific cause. And it moved me um, just to see the level of philanthropy. I mean, obviously there were people who were giving five and $10 donations all over the world. Uh, Bernie Sanders pushed it out to his supporters. They started contributing. Uh, we had uh, literally um, uh, uh, organizations like PepsiCo uh, 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 that were uh, supporting us. Uh, the Rudin family uh, in New York, uh, the Rudin Family Foundation uh, made a very sizable contribution. We just started seeing uh, the whole thing snowball. And it's really been transformative in terms of how uh, not just the Center for Infection and Immunity that Ian runs um, has been able to respond to COVID, but it's also just been broadly helping New York and really all over, over the world as we've been now rolling out this test uh, out, uh, pr pretty much as, as many places as would uh, be willing to uh, to start rolling it out. Yeah, it's, it's strange how the government gave out pretty quickly two million million dollars, right? Two trillion dollars with the with the with the act. And then, yeah. you know, to get to raise a couple million dollars for a test, which allows us to op reopen the economy, uh, you have to you know, go, go to Indigo Go. Uh, what, um, what, uh, tell us a little bit about what, you know, from getting so close to this and seeing how testing is evolving, what should we expect to see uh, in testing over the next sort of few months? Should it be possible for employers to, you know, test every employee, you know, as they walk in the door and get the results in 10 minutes or, you know, how much yeah. will that cost? Like, wh wh what do you see happening in testing over the following few months? Sure. So um, I do think that there are, uh, through our, our venture fund, we have seen a, a few very, very promising companies that are working on home diagnostic platforms or office diagnostic platforms where the reality of what you're talking about could uh, definitely um, be, be there and, and be there in short order, literally within the next, uh, within the next quarter. Um, so I, I do think that that is entirely possible. Uh, in the case of the C3 test, a lot of what tests of this sensitivity have been useful for is literally launching um, uh, clinical trials for cures. So in order to actually test cures, you need to have the, know the viral load and, and have a quantitative assessment of, of how what you are doing is impacting the virus in a patient. And so uh, Columbia has launched, uh, I think, uh, between four and six clinical trials now because of the C3 test. Uh, we are testing uh, uh, both the uh, Moderna and the AstraZeneca uh, vaccines within the next a uh, few months are, are now rolling out uh, um, clinical trials uh, where, where this test will be used as well. And so I think that um, testing is absolutely in our future. I don't expect it to go away. Uh, I expect there to be lots of innovation and there's a lot of startups now that are sort of shifting their focus to doing this in a broad base. And I, I think that it's really going to shift forward healthcare decades um, in a very short amount of time. Let's turn to your second pillar and talk a little bit about shadow. So I live in New York City. 
if we lost our uh, black standard poodle, which would be a disaster, if, if Machu Picchu ran off, what would we do? Uh, how like what with your app? How how would the app help help us uh, get reunited? Sure. So broadly speaking, just talking about the breadth of the problem, um, lost. Uh, lost pets is uh, there's about 100 million lost pets per year globally, 10 million in the U.S., and about 27% of them get reunited uh, if they end up in a shelter. So it's not really great odds. And um, I came about uh, recognizing this problem. I was at a dinner a few years ago, and I met... Um, I met an artist named Brad Kunkel and Brad has a puppy named Shadow. They were in a, uh, they were at a birthday party and a friend of his birthday party and there was some loud music and Shadow got spooked and ran away. And so Brad uh, pretty much stopped everything he was doing and he started looking uh, for his dog and literally uh, obviously uh, combed the streets, but he stopped working. He, they didn't find her that evening and they, he literally would would uh, spend a full time, uh, full time searching for Shadow. And he sort of saw the good and the bad of humanity, the, the good being that total strangers dropped everything they were doing to help him. The bad being that um, he saw the evils of humanity. People tried to, to lure him to a park to mug him for the reward money. Uh, people try to find dogs that look like Shadow to convince him they're a Shadow for the reward money. And in the end, when I met him, he was going to give up. And I was very moved by his story. And I was like, you cannot give up. I don't know what I'm going to do, but we will find Shadow. And a, a week later, he got a phone call from someone who was eight miles away from where Shadow went missing, saying they saw her poking her head through a fence in front of a wooded area at the end of the dead end street. And he was like, what are the odds? My puppy's still living wild uh, at the end of uh, a month in the streets of Brooklyn. Uh, but he drove out there, and unfortunately, he didn't see her. He drove out there a second night. He didn't see her again, and as he was leaving, totally demoralized, ready to give up, he just heard then a, uh, a jingle like it was coming from a dog collar. And he waited around for a few minutes, and sure enough, he saw a little nose poking her head through this fence. He was super excited. He went running after her, yelling her name, and she had gone feral, and she ran away. So he had to feed her fried chicken every day for a week to get her to come back to the same spot. And at the end of the week, they set a humane trap, little shadow, big fence. She's jumping over the fence. They're holding her hind legs back. And as soon as her nose touches Brad's arm, her tail starts to wag. She starts to cry and they're reunited. So why am I telling you this story? Um, I think many aspects of what Brad had gone through were things that I think lend themselves well to uh, um a, a, a sort of a technology enabled community. Uh, and I went on this journey recognizing, uh, can we figure out ways to use these mobile phones in our pockets to actually really um, solve this problem for, for people and for families. And I went off and um, spent uh, a few <laughs> Uh, a few months learning how to actually be a pet detective. So I'm a trained missing animal response professional. I have the certificate in my office and uh, literally learned how to reunite people with their pets. And we spent uh, uh, the first six months just doing things manually. And then we built an app we released in 2018 uh, that ended up reuniting 600 dogs that year. We were named one of New York City's, uh, by the New York shelter system, one of their their heroes for the year. And we then reunited uh, last year over 2,500 dogs in New York uh, and now have taken the service to uh, a few other American cities, Los Angeles, Houston, Dallas, and now Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, we, The way the app works um, is... If someone loses or finds uh, a, a dog, they upload the photograph. Uh, we've scoured the web, every shelter, every rescue, every social media outlet, and we have now ingested all of those photographs. And within seconds, I, we hopefully identify the match and present that to the user. Uh, and if that does not work, uh, we then will uh, programmatically set a search radius based on where and when the dog went missing. And we will feed the people the actions they can take that have the highest probability of getting their dogs back. And they can take these actions, their friends can take these actions, and our growing community of volunteers can take these actions. 
And the net result of that is reunion rates that are um, literally triple the national average. So uh, we are um, uh, in our oldest markets, close to 80% of, 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 of the dogs that go missing are now reunited. Uh, and compare that to 27%, which is the average reunion rate if a dog ends up in a shelter. Wow. What what are some of those actions that people should take? Does it vary by the circumstance? Like, what, what are some actions that uh, someone yeah. should take? So it it, it, it it falls into a handful of buckets. So there are things relating to broadcast, getting the word out, uh, things relating to searching, uh, and then things relating to actually um, uh, trapping a lost dog. So those are three broad buckets. Uh, on the broadcast side, we, of course, enable people uh, to easily post to all, all of these social media platforms, but also uh, if they want, they can um, uh, very quickly within one click uh, have an ad out to sort of amplify the effects of what they've shared. Uh, they, uh, we of course uh, uh, print flyers for them. One of the challenges that Brad had was that people were calling him and trying to defraud him. And what we learned early on when we were doing this manually is if we could actually give people a proxy phone number, we could solve that problem because if people know the call is being recorded, they're less likely to want to do devious things. So we, we, we sort of give them that and that's sort of the number they use for their entire search. Uh, we then help give them the tools to uh, for them and the volunteers to basically just scour the neighborhood with flyers. So uh, literally uh, you can see where other people are posting flyers and uh, where hasn't post flyers have not been posted and you can deploy things that way. So, uh, you can also with one click uh, send what we call a dog Amber alert, which notifies everybody um, in your network uh, of uh, the fact that your dog is missing. So that's, those are the kinds of actions one can take on a um, broadcast side. And then on the searching side, uh, as I mentioned, we have ingested all the information of what dogs are in what shelters, et cetera. And so we enable people to, of course, we use AI to give them the ones that are the highest matches, but we also enable them to, to systemically go through every single shelter because you know this is a lost family member. You're not going to just trust what the technology tells you. Sometimes the dog may have looked disheveled or you know, it looked darker in a photograph, et cetera. So we enable them to go through every single rescue, every single shelter, and check every single dog to make sure they're not their dog. And we sort of manage that entire process and make it seamless for them. And when there's new ones, we sort of push it to them, et cetera. Uh, and so that is the element of, 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 of search that we do. Trapping is not something that we are involved in, though we are partners with a number of local organizations in all of our, our markets where that's literally, um, it's an amazing skill. And, and, and uh, you know, many people are, are just uh, spend all their free time helping uh, lost, uh, lost pets in suburban areas get, um, uh, get trapped, uh, which is effectively what Brad had to do in Brooklyn when Shadow went missing. And so it's not something that we do uh, do yet within the app, but it's uh, it's, it's sort of the, the the last part of the solution. On that broadcast part, that's one thing that maybe I'm just not sophisticated enough, but it still seems like technology hasn't really solved yet of how to. And it's kind of so it's interesting that one of the approaches still is to go around and sort of tape up flyers in your neighborhood. That there's not a great way to, if you live in Astoria, to post something i know there's like what the neighborhood app or something but there's not a great way to post something to people in your immediate area even if you wanted to pay for advertising you know and so it would go on twitter or facebook or or other things to get to people just in a very narrow geographic area yeah you know i think um uh sorry so the question specifically being um i mean i guess it just seems like that's something that still hasn't been solved but um, so one of the tips that you suggest is is still putting out kind of paper flyers and taping them up. I think you have to do both. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, this is a um, time is of the essence. And the sooner you get out there, the better off your chances are going to be. And so there are definitely pe dog lovers who are not on social media. And, you know, there's been a, a sort of a you know, a, a broad, uh, the broad trends are that people are no longer on Facebook as much as they used to be. And I, I think that the, the, the tides are changing from some of the other social platforms as well. Uh, so you definitely want to make sure that you're out there and that's the most quick thing that you can do. But you'd be surprised at how many people are still um, needing to be in the streets and hanging the flyers the old fashioned way uh, as a means of getting, uh, getting their dog back. You know, I, Peter Thiel has this famous question about you know, what do you believe to be true that 
most people do not. W what's your belief about shadow and about solving lost? I believe that humans are good. And I think so much of technology assumes that people are maybe egotistical and self-centered. And I think the vast majority of human humanity is, is, is good. And what we're trying to do is build the technology to help make it easy for people to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that is, um, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely, uh, uh, it's something I, I wish more technology companies would actually do. Um, because I, I do think that the grand social media experiment, um, of the past, uh, decade and a half, um, has largely failed on the dimension of bringing us closer together. I think in many respects it's brought us further apart. Yeah. And uh, as someone who my life's work is to use technology to make humanity better, um, you know, it's um, that's not very reassuring. And so I, I want to believe that we can use technology to make us more human. I love that. I, that's generally been my experience. I've, um, you know, in the course of living in New York over the past decade, I think a couple times. We've had a, a lost wallet that's been returned to us, and you know, even I mean, still with the cash inside. Um, and yeah. you know, and on several occasions, you know, we found a wallet in one case, a cell phone, and managed to return it to their owner. It's not always that easy, uh, or even like a big duffel bag with also like a wallet and an iPhone and everything. Sometimes it's yeah. not that easy. And it, one one thing I learned is, you know, put something in your in your wallet that has your phone number on it because you know generally you walk around and maybe i'll have your id and stuff but it's not that easy yeah. to contact you if you just drop your wallet somewhere um yeah say you know if found please call uh so now i tape that on the back of my iphone like hey if found please call me at this number and don't put it don't yeah. make it your own number because <laughs> you won't <laughs> you know <laughs> make it some, yeah. some of friends um yeah let's talk about humbition a little bit uh, yeah. Tell me about, you said you're kind of industry agnostic. Um, I don't know if you can talk about either some specific investments you made or, or um, just maybe, maybe even kind of the, the type of advice you mentioned that as, as a you know, operator of ZocDoc, a founder, you found that investors often gave you some of the best uh, advice who were former, former operators. What's some of the advice that you often find yourself giving to founders Um, so I think my, uh, my formula for success at ZocDoc, uh, was great people, hard work, focus, and time. And I felt that if I, if a, if a company had those four ingredients, like they were really unstoppable. Through my work at Shadow, I've realized that hard work is important, but hard work is a byproduct of purpose alignment. Long so to make it sustainable, it should be a byproduct of of, of um, purpose alignment. So my new formula is great people, purpose alignment, focus, and time. And it, you know, there's obviously nuance and specifics of the advice that we give, but if I was to literally just categorize everything that I I talk to people, I, you know, I, I, great people. How do they get the right talent? Um, who do we know who could help them? Uh, how do they recruit? You know, ZocDoc at my peak, I probably had 40 internal recruiters like who were helping us hire folks. For, and, 40 internal recruiters. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, this is when we were scaling up really rapidly. And uh, I wasted probably 10,000 hours interviewing people that I should not have been interviewing. And I, uh, uh, our head of uh, sales at the time, Florian Otto, who's now the CEO of Cedar, which is a great company that I'm a proud investor in, um, he introduced me to this book called Who by GH Smart. It's a book about how to hire the best talent. And it talked about really just, um, really just uh, using your own network and leveraging the great people you know and the great people they know and just go distinctive person to distinctive person. And I remember when I read that book, when I was running ZocDoc, I was on the on beach and, uh, like, uh, for like a spring holiday. And I, I turned around to a friend of mine who I thought very highly of. And I asked him for the person he thought, uh, was, um, 
he thought was distinctive. I met that person and her former boss turned out was this digital marketing expert, um, uh, Melissa Esmundo, who we ended up talking to and recruiting as an executive at ZocDoc, and she was great. And uh, that same search may have taken me six months going through recruiters. So helping people with recruiting and questions like that and, and sort of evangelizing this book uh, and the, its approach to, to recruiting and, and really developing a muscle early on in a company's life about using, uh, you know, t- t- using talented people to find talented people, which in many respects, I, I'm sure you appreciate because it's at the core of, of perhaps at the core of Umbrex as well, right? Which you've got these network of talented consultants, et cetera. And, and uh, I think that uh, uh, they're probably bringing the next wave of great talented consultants to you guys. That's right. Uh, That's true. Yeah. Well, we, uh, we very much believe that it's, you know, personal relationships are more powerful than uh, kind of a more anonymous IT enabled platform uh, for, for that kind of um, matching function. Uh, I agree. Talk about purpose alignment. What, what, what does that mean in, in practice? So, you know, in, in the case of uh, when you're hiring for any role, most of us focus on does this person have the skills that are needed for us in this role? Um, do they have the experience that, that, that demonstrates they have those skills? Um, very few organizations, though, that's seeming to change, ask the question, is this person aligned to our purpose? Do they really, is their reason for breathing our reason for breathing? And I think that if you have alignment there, it makes so many other things so much simpler, both in terms of what we should be doing next, but also just in terms of working hard to achieve the underlying mission of the organization. And so uh, there was, uh, it wasn't until I left ZocDoc that I read Simon Sinek's Start With Why, but it is a, uh, it is a fantastic description of how to really move humans and get really organize a big group of folks to really see the world differently and to make the world different. Uh, and so I, um, I really, uh, as an investor, I, um, I don't need to be, I, I, the, the purpose of any startup that we invest in does not need to be my highest purpose, but it needs to be the highest purpose of the entrepreneur running the company. And, I would then encourage that entrepreneur to make sure that that is the purpose of every single person that's working with them. And I, I think to some extent, like if I was to be self-reflective, uh, when running ZocDoc, you know, ZocDoc itself was my purpose. This is my child. I, I, you know, I ruptured a near drum when I started this company and, and uh, I love the company. I would die to this day. I would die for the company. And I, uh, but I, it wasn't a filter for me that 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 people needed to care about healthcare access as a as a requirement to being on the team. And what I found through Shadow, where I've introduced purpose alignment as sort of the primary criteria, not just for employees, for any vendors, et cetera, they need to care about what we're doing. You know, some people will look at reuniting lost dogs and be like, well, that's kind of a silly thing. And some people will be like, you know what? That's amazing. That's a family member. You're doing like God's work. And I think when you get people who are aligned to the ladder you see a level of commitment that's akin to like how founders behave in their company. So almost everyone behaves like a founder and that's a really powerful thing. Um, and, and so, um, making sure that we are picking purpose aligned, uh, businesses and, and those that have, uh, founders that are really committed to the cause. That's a, a big part of what we do as investors. And, uh, uh, yeah, I think I've been uh, very fortunate that we've now probably invested in about a dozen companies and um, uh, the portfolio is going very well. And, and I, I liken it to the fact that we've, we've got talented folks who are, in many cases, um, uh, working on, on causes that are bigger than themselves. How should a founder, you know, test that in a potential employee or or how do you as an investor test that? purpose alignment when you're talking to founders to, to judge? I mean, because people can just say, oh, yes, this is very important to me. But h- how do you really get at 
to see if someone is deeply committed to the purpose of the organization? Well, with in assessing the founder, understanding their founding story and their journey to getting to the company, if they said, look, I really wanted to start a, this, you know, a business and I just graduated from grad school and like I looked at the sector and thought this opportunity was different, blah, blah, blah. Like, I think that's different than saying, look, I experienced this problem uh, and I realized I felt compelled to solve it and this is the steps I've taken to go after it. And I think... For me, in the case of Shadow, you know the story I told you at the top of this uh, call uh, about Brad and Shadow. Uh, I I tell that story multiple times per day, and I assess how people because I tell it so much. It's I am able to sense how people respond to it, and depending on how they respond, I really do get a sense for if this is a, a purpose that they um, that they they care about. And uh, uh, I think oftentimes you can just go through people's backgrounds and understanding. Um, you know, there, there are questions you can ask, uh, literally like asking someone directly, like what is, the, what is the thing they care about most in the world? What would they be willing to risk everything for? And you sort of just understand uh, how they're, they're, they're wired. And not to say that every, you know, everyone that works at Shadow came in saying that finding lost dogs was their sole purpose, but they all obviously love animals and they all love the idea of helping people, they all have, uh, I think, a, a deep down inside, they all have servant hearts. Uh, I like to think that I do as well. And I think that is, um, th those are the, sort of the common threads. Um, and it enables us to have, um, to not have debates that um, are, uh, counter to the company's reason for existing. So, you know, we will not do anything that will harm the reunion rate of a dog, period. And that's actually, we, we even in terms of our organizational structure, there's new organizational structures called public benefit corporations, which are for-profit businesses that have the mission and the charter. And I think uh, it's, it's something that was pioneered by B, B Labs, which is the, the, the organization behind B Corp. And so we're a public benefit corporation. And we have in our mission, our charter, our job, yes, of course, we want to maximize shareholder value. But equally uh, important to us is, is making sure that we fulfill our mission. Hmm. I love that. Yeah, and we, we just, I, just, I just learned about uh, the B certification. We had an episode where I interviewed uh, an expert in that topic just a few episodes ago, uh, and that's powerful that you're doing that. Um, talk to me about the, the, the other two, uh, focus and time. What, what do those mean to you in practice? So focus, I think, is the most powerful force in business. Um, I think Steve Jobs, if we just really analyze what he did at Apple, uh, uh, one of the things he really did was, was was to focus the company. He got rid of 100 products and he brought it down to five. And they made the most valuable company in the world off of five products. And so I think um, oftentimes the smartest people in the world um, tend to try to do too much. And that results in a bunch of half-built bridges, etc. And the more you can distill down to the most important things to do, the more you will succeed. And so at ZocDoc, I always found that whenever a team is not doing well, I asked them to put on a board. We hired all these talented people. I'd ask them to write on the board all the things that weren't going well, that they were doing rather, all the things they were doing. And there'd be like 12 things. I'm like, great, now cross off 10 or 11. And this happened three or four times. And then once we just pulled back to what the team um, the most important thing for that team, miraculously, those most important things really started to outperform. And you know, I think uh, I had never worked in an organization that had implemented OKRs at ZocDoc. Uh, we introduced initially, uh, we called them Monster Goals. It was our version of OKRs. I use OKRs now at all of my companies. Uh, and uh, it really is a great exercise in uh, you know, the, the, the premise being come up with an objective that is very motivational and, and, and perhaps not even quantitative, like is, is, is objective, is just 
something that will appeal to people's um, inner purpose and then come out with uh, key results that are very specific. Uh, and I think that exercise of going through and following up with your, your OKRs and really being disciplined about it is something that um, uh, I, uh, I do and enables us to um, not um, uh, it's probably more important to articulate what you're not going to do and uh, make sure that we don't, we don't do those things. And so, especially for young companies, um, if we believe that markets are efficient, the only real reason a startup should exist is if it's able to focus on something that some big company is not. And so even if I were to sort of extrapolate out the competitive set of ZocDoc, like all of our early competitors, the reason why we won is probably because we, we, we had a less experienced team and less money than all of our competitors. But that enabled us to stay focused on dentists in New York City, specifically Manhattan, for the first two years of the company's life. And we just got it really great at that. And then we only then did we move on to Brooklyn and we moved on to primary care doctors. But it took us three and a half years to get there. So, you know, I do think that too many times entrepreneurs come in with the grand vision. The grand vision is important, but you need to understand what are the atomic things to be focused on and uh, uh, not do too much. And it's uh, the last point I'll make on this, which is, most people assume that startups um, starve and that's the reason why they predominantly fail. And that is not true. The reason why most startups fail is they drown. They do too much. Uh, time. So time is sort of the last component of this formula. I, uh, you know, time, if you really have, if you think about it, if you have people who are talented and they are, focused and they're really working on something that's meaningful um it's only a matter of time before they figure it out and so time is really a function of of um i mean it can be a function of money in many respects like the stronger your balance sheet is making sure your burn rate doesn't get out of control and you know that gives you the ability to fail and to learn and to iterate etc and so you really want to make sure that you have the time to be successful uh, and because it ultimately, if the team has all these prior ingredients, they're really just not never going to give up and you just need to make sure that they, they, they are able to get there. I also think time, um, as you scale up organizations, we've all been in situations where we feel like we are in too many meetings. And so I also think of time as, is, is, is the most valuable, re literally it is more valuable than money. Um, because you've gone through the effort of finding these talented folks and it is, it, it is, um, too many companies to sort of waste time. And so being very disciplined about not having reoccurring meetings, not doing ad hoc meetings for everything. Uh, one of the things we do at Shadow that I'm proud about is um, we only have ad hoc meetings for four hours a week. We have two hours on Tuesdays and two hours on Thursdays. And whenever something comes up that you need to meet about, that's great. It goes in the queue of those four hours. And oftentimes, you know what, something you thought was so important last week keeps getting pushed to the bottom of the queue and we never meet on it and that's okay. Um, and so it prevents you from being in the situation where, you know, the, the limit um, to how much time you'll spend on something is the waking hours you're awake, the, the hours you're awake and, and, and rather it, it focuses on what the most important things are. And so it's a different way of, again, staying focused. Um, so I'm sure my, my formula will continue to evolve, but you know, it's really simple. Um, great people, uh, purpose alignment, focus and time. And I think all of the advice I give probably fits in one of these four buckets. Well, Cyrus, that was a masterclass in how to be successful at a startup. I feel this is, you know, the elements of a, of a, of a, the next Ted talk that you'll give. This was fantastic. <laughs> um, Cyrus, Thank for, you. for folks who want to learn more about what you're doing, do, do you want to share any links that I can include in the show notes to either your investment fund or your app or, or anything else that you have going on? Sure. Well, for people who, who just love dogs or know people who love dogs or hopefully you don't lose or find a dog, but uh, uh, if you do, uh, Shadow is the name of the app. It's on the App Store. Uh, our domain name on the web is shadowapp.com. Uh, our investment fund is um, Humbition. Um, which is uh, our uh, 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 sort of a made-up word, obviously, and, and 
sort of the best way to, to, to find us there is, you know, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, find the person that we know in common who uh, you think the most highly of and, and uh, ask them to connect us. And uh, I'd be delighted to meet anyone that's an entrepreneur that wants advice or uh, is looking for a seed or series A investment. Um, and uh, in general for, um, for Columbia, for people that are interested in, in, in uh, uh, you know, there's many more work, there's much more work that uh, uh, we need to do. Um, and uh, c3test.org is the, the uh, URL that now redirects to the Columbia University uh, uh, website where we raise money for the Center for Infection and Immunity and Ian Lipkin's lab. And uh, we welcome people who want to be involved um, uh, uh, there as well. We, uh, we there's m much more to do. Um, you know, this is the this is the first real pandemic of our lifetimes. But if we don't act, it will not be the last. Well, Cyrus, thank you so much for joining. This has been an amazing discussion. Uh, well, it's uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, my friend. Thank you for having me.